The Shooting Range. In this episode, Pages of History, Isaac Laden's Hated Child, Tactics and Strategy, Training Aircraft Crews, and Metal Beasts, a sturdy oldie with a big gun. We have this little tradition where we sometimes break up our narrative flow full of brand new vehicles with good old ones that settled down in your hangars a while ago. And today's metal beast is the legendary Soviet IS-2, a heavy tank that passed the test of time and earned the fame of a fearsome opponent for any ground vehicle. Let's find out what it can do today. Its main caliber is a 122mm gun with elevation angles between minus 3 and plus 20 degrees. The layout is classic. The driver sits in the front, and the other three crew members are found in the turret, and the engine compartment is in the rear. The ammo stowage is spread throughout the combat compartment. The IS-2's main advantage is its gun. It's capable of penetrating most opponents at pretty much any distance, with no aim for vulnerabilities required. The main projectile here is a flathead ballistic-capped shell with a hefty load of explosives, almost 250 grams of TNT equivalent. Pair this gun with these shells and you have enough to send any enemy to the hangar with a single shot. But everything comes at a price. If you miss, you might not get another chance. This wonder gun has a very long reload time. Which means aiming your gun carefully should also be accompanied by thinking through your retreat plan for the reload. Fortunately, it's not going to be an issue. The IS is pretty mobile for a heavy tank. More than that, it's unusually quick in reverse for Soviet tanks, which is often used for a unique fighting style known as the Ferdinand style. The trick is simple. Turn your hull 180 degrees before the battle and advance with your rear. It's armored well enough to handle some hits when angled, and if the incoming projectile does penetrate the armor, the engine compartment will soak up the shrapnel. It still means damage to the machine, but much less than getting hit into the combat compartment full of crew, ammo, and fuel. To make penetration even harder for your enemy, we suggest that you try angling your hull and rotating your turret before an expected hit. That makes it much harder to aim for vulnerabilities on your curved, angled armor. Thanks to the powerful gun, a high level of mobility, and a good level of protection, this Soviet tank can perform various roles on the battlefield depending on what the situation requires. It can be both a support machine that hits the most dangerous enemies and hides for a reload, or an advancing machine, going through enemy defenses and taking a few hits on its own. All of this is also true for later IS-2 1944 machines, a family recently reinforced with a new event vehicle. They have a higher battle rating, but their frontal armor is significantly stronger. The vulnerable lower front plate is still there, though, so it still makes sense to turn your back on the enemy even on those later modifications. As for the gun, well, it doesn't care what tanks to shoot at. You might need to aim for vulnerabilities on some extra heavy foes, but they're still guaranteed to see the hangar after penetration. The Catalina, an ingenious creation of Isaac Ladin, shook the U.S. aircraft market in the mid-1930s. It was selling like hotcakes, both among civilian and Navy clients. And this was only the beginning. Even the Catalina's creator himself had no idea how successful it was to become. A faithful, peaceful, and honest person, Ladin was probably very happy to go down in history as a peacemaking aviation engineer, the designer of an aircraft that connected the skies, the ground, and the water, consolidated humanity, and made a difference. In fact, saved people. Even the name of Ladin's employer was fitting for that kind of work, consolidated. Meanwhile, humanity was steaming off towards a new major war. The U.S. Air Force was planning a big rearmament, and the bosses at Consolidated decided to take part in the competition to build a new strategic bomber. The only problem they had was their main engineer. Ladin had no desire to create a killer plane. What could they do? Entice him. First introduce him to another genius, 
His name was David Davis, and he'd proposed a revolutionary aerodynamic wing profile. This amazing high aspect ratio wing would be installed onto the future B-24 and help it achieve a speed and range simply phenomenal for the time. Moreover, they could put off the engineer's guard by presenting the project as a multi-purpose plane. You know, it'll never be mass-produced, and if they do use it as a bomber, it would only be as an addition to the already existing mass-produced B-17. Of course, Isaac Ladin was far from naive. He knew exactly what he was creating. But he also couldn't sabotage his own work or do it poorly. Even when creating a plane he didn't like, he made a masterpiece. Maybe he'd actually hoped things would come right. For some reason or another, the project may never hit mass production and would never become recognizable. We'd never know. What we do know, though, is this. When the prototype was first tested in the spring of 1939, the military was so happy that they commissioned no less than 6,000 of these planes. More so, they doubled down when the war broke out in Europe. As it blazed up, Douglas and North American companies joined the construction of the Liberators. More than that, the Ford Company, who had only some indirect ties to aviation previously, even built an enormous production center for the B-24, capable of assembling a fully capable bomber every hour. 24 planes a day. That's a whole regiment of heavy bombers. So yes, the B-24 went on to become the most mass-produced piston-engined strategic bomber in history. Official figures alone show that no less than 18,482 of them were built. It was a world record, and Isaac Ladin's name could have been lettered in gold in the history books, but he wanted nothing of the sort. The realization of what monster he'd unleashed onto the world must have hit him so hard that it broke him, and Ladin never made another notable aircraft again. Consolidated would soon lose competition to Boeing with its famous B-29 and even lose its own name after merging with Vulti Aircraft into Convair. As for Ladin, he later played some background roles in designing jet airliners and refused to take part in any military projects. Aged too soon, he was often seen at air shows next to his beloved Catalinas, but never around the B-24. Every time you recall Isaac Ladin today, remember that he considered the Catalina his main achievement. It was this sound, peaceful machine that he was proud of not the perfect tool of war. We've recently talked about tank crews and discussed the best ways of improving them to achieve maximum battle efficiency. And today we'd like to focus our attention on the skills of pilots and service personnel. You can gain aircraft crew points the same way as for tank crews, so there's not much use in going over it again. Crew points directly depend on the research points you gain in battle, and you can boost it for Golden Eagles. To achieve the maximum skill level of an aircraft crew, you need 33,381 points. The training menu has three tabs, Pilot, Defensive Armament, and Logistical Services. We'll start with the first one, where all the pilot skills can be found. Vitality is the one we'd like to talk about first here. At the lowest levels, the pilot can survive a single small caliber round or a similar shrapnel wound. A trained pilot can even sustain a large caliber round hit with some luck. Pilot vitality is essential for any aircraft crew. Bombers need it to survive interceptor attacks, attack aircraft need it to sustain ground anti-aircraft fire, and fighters need it for successful frontal attacks. Speaking of fighter pilots, their next most important skills are G-tolerance and stamina. We recommend you train these equally. The former, as you might have guessed, affects the worst positive or negative G-loads a pilot can sustain while performing a sharp maneuver. The latter affects the maximum duration of above-tolerance loads a pilot can sustain and the recovery time required for a pilot who did lose consciousness due to overload. Next, we have the skills affecting enemy detection, keen vision, and awareness. The better they are, the further a pilot can spot enemies or missile launches in modes with markers. Many aircraft, though, have crews of more than a single pilot, so let's see what we've got in the Defensive Armament tab. Some of these are already familiar, such as Vitality, Stamina, and G-Tolerance. 
Since aircraft with defensive turrets don't often join high-energy dogfights, the truly important skill here is vitality. Gunners are constantly under fire. It's their job, after all. If you don't like taking manual control over turrets, take a look at fire precision and accuracy. Upgrading these will improve the distance at which your gunners start firing and, more importantly, help them score a few hits. Now, the last point here is the number of experienced gunners. If you point your cursor at it, you can see how many gunners your aircraft has, and there's no use in upgrading the skill any further since, unfortunately, it won't add any more turrets anyways. The more experienced gunners you have, the more successful their firing will be. But no matter how experienced the gunners or the entire crew is, players always score better. So when you can, switch to manual control to significantly improve your chances. The last tab here, the Logistical Services, has some skills you might remember from our previous video, Repair Speed and Repair Rank. These affect the repair speed in the hangar, on the airfield, and in port. We should note that these skills are shared between all kinds of vehicles a cruise mechanics can fix, meaning if you upgrade this for tanks, you won't have to do it again for aircraft. But aircraft also expect a higher qualification from the crew, so their logistical services tab has a couple of unique traits. Reload speed affects the time required to restock your ammo on the airfield, or mid-air if you're playing arcade. It's pretty useful, but has almost no effect on battle efficiency. Now, weapon maintenance is basically the opposite. Upgrading this skill will reduce bomb and rocket spread, which is great for assault, and decrease the chance of weapon jamming, which means longer continuous fire for you. Well, that's it. Use your knowledge well and train your crews. Meanwhile, we'll answer some of the questions you ask us in the comments. The first question was sent by a player called Fusion Chicken. Why do all the Soviet jets have so few bullets for their cannons? Hey there, your question made us think. Why don't we dedicate a whole Pages of History section to it? There's a lot to tell there, so you'll see it in one of our episodes. Mursak asks, Hey, in the aircraft control settings, there are options for horizontal and vertical radar slash IRST target queue control axis. When I mapped and tested them, I didn't see any effect on my radar display or search zones. What are these options supposed to do, and what aircraft can use them? Hi, Mersac. These settings are responsible for moving the target queue that chooses a target on your radar screen. They work on all vehicles with radar if you disable Target's Cyclic Switching of Aircraft Radar for aircraft or Target's Cyclic Switching of Ground Radar for AA vehicles and vessels. Another question comes from 777GL1. What's the difference between the two rocket types from the German Wiesel II Ocelot AA tank? Hey there! The upgradable missile, Modification K, has a proximity fuse, which improves its battle efficiency. Skipper N10 writes, Do APS systems work behind smoke? Hi, Skipper. That's a good question. Active protection systems use radar to detect threats, and no smoke ever stopped them. And the last comment for today was written by Type 5 Hori. I'd really like to see a rocket interceptor triathlon. Can you do one? Hello, Type 5. Nice idea. Thanks, but we don't have enough participants to have a full triathlon. Let's have a small competition here instead and see who's quicker. Lining up at the start? Let's go. The Soviet vehicle breaks right off, leaving the others behind. At first, the German and the Japanese aircraft are going even, but the Comet soon overtakes its counterpart. Well, we guess the race is over. That's it for today. You've been watching The Shooting Range by Gaijin Entertainment, and the next episode will premiere the following Sunday at 4 p.m. GMT or noon Eastern Time. Subscribe and click the bell if you don't want to miss our next videos. Don't forget to leave a like. Give your crews a good pep talk before battle, share your thoughts and comments, and see you next week.